Welcome vintage camera lovers and today let's journey back to 1996 when Olympus launched the Comedia brand with their first three consumer digicams, the C400, C400L and the star of this particular video, the top end C800L. Like most digicam firsts, it's important to distinguish between consumer and business or professional models as many companies offered both types in the early days. Olympus was no different, producing the business-focused Deltis series from as far back as 93, but these were expensive and specialist cameras, some with the ability to even transmit photos down a phone line. Who'd want to electronically send photos to other people? In contrast, the Comedia series, launched in 96, was aimed squarely at the consumer market, and at a time when many rivals were being highly experimental with design, Olympus took the opposite route, deliberately ensuring that their first consumer digicams looked just like their existing compact 35mm film cameras. In fact, at first glance, it was hard to distinguish the three new models from their analogue counterparts, especially so for the entry-level C400, which didn't even have a screen on the back to give the game away. From the front, it was only the branding which told you that these were digital cameras. The entry-level, screenless C400, probably known as the D200L in North America, had a 0.3 megapixel sensor with 640x480 pixels and 1 megabyte of internal memory. The C400L, also known as the D200L, added a rear screen and doubled the internal memory to 2 megabytes. And finally, the flagship C800L, also known as the D300L, boosted the resolution to 0.8 megapixels, delivering images with 1024 by 768 pixels, increased the internal memory to a considerable 6 megabytes, and was the only one of the three models to sport autofocus. These were pretty impressive specs in 1996. Indeed, the C800L's better than average sensor and memory specifications at the time did price it towards the higher end of the consumer market, costing around $999 or pounds when it was announced in October 1996. This is why Olympus also offered simpler versions at a lower price point, but it's the flagship C800L that's proudly featured in their own corporate history pages and also in this video. The three Comedia cameras shared essentially the same styling, with chunky but familiar looking bodies, featuring a satisfying S curve viewed from the top, curling outwards into a decent sized grip with a textured surface. Like many Olympus 35mm compacts, the lens is hidden behind a panel on the front, which slides open to power it up. Olympus was a master at this kind of mechanism, with the sliding panel providing a satisfyingly physical experience, something that I personally feel is lacking in the industrial design of most modern cameras. I really enjoy pushing it back and forth, and it obviously also acts as a lens cap, so there's no accessories to lose. All three of the first Comedia cameras shared the same fixed lens, with a 5mm focal length, roughly equivalent to around 35mm in coverage, and with a maximum aperture of f2.8. Exposure was fully automatic, and in the absence of EXIF data on the images, it's hard to know exactly what shutter speeds, apertures and sensitivities were available to the camera. Turning to the top surface are five buttons flanking a small LCD information screen, with the large shutter release on the right-hand side doubling as an OK button. With the lens open to take photos, the first button on the left toggles between standard and high quality modes on the C800L capturing images with 512 by 384 or an impressive 1024 by 768 pixels. Remember that most rival cameras at this time were stalling with 640x480 quality and most computer monitors were running between this resolution and XGA and that allowed the C800L's photos to fill many computer screens and maybe even allow a little zooming in. To compare the two quality modes on the C800L, I took this photo of Brighton Pier using both settings, starting with the best looking HQ option here. Zooming in for a closer look reveals more detail than many of the VGA resolution cameras that I've tested for this channel, a difference that's reinforced when I compare the HQ version on the left alongside the standard SQ version on the right. So you're looking at 1024 by 768 pixels on the left versus 512 by 384 on the right, and the JPEGs here measured 411 and 81 kilobytes respectively. Like most consumer cameras in 1996, the three comedians stored their images in internal memory, leaving removable memory cards to more expensive or later models. 
The C400, C400L and C800L were equipped with one, two and an impressive six megabytes of memory respectively. And the latter on the flagship C800L really let it stand apart from the crowd, allowing you to store up to 30 photos in the best quality mode or 120 in the standard. But obviously when the memory was full, you either had to delete or download the images to free up the space. Returning to the controls, the second button toggles the macro mode for closer focusing, while the third button toggles the self timer. Meanwhile, to the right of the screen are buttons to adjust the flash mode, including a red eye reduction option, and to delete the last image. The top screen itself indicated the macro, self timer and flash modes, as well as the battery life and the number of shots remaining. On the rear, there's the choice of an optical viewfinder or a 1.8 inch color screen for composition. To activate live view for screen-based framing, just push the green button alongside it. Although on my C800L sample 27 years later, it didn't want to stay on for long, so I mostly use the viewfinder for this review. Pushing the green button with the lens panel closed though, powers the camera into playback mode, which didn't have any problems with this model, with standard quality images appearing almost straight away, but HQ photos taking a couple of seconds each to load from the internal memory. The various buttons allow you to view thumbnails, start a slideshow, and selectively delete single images or format the entire memory. There's no exposure control other than to choose if or when the flash goes off, and there's no menus on the main color screen either. For simplicity and battery saving, all of the settings you can change are via the top screen and the buttons to either side. The three cameras are each powered by four AA batteries, and I'm happy to report they switch on just fine when using Eneloop rechargeables over a quarter of a century later. Take that rechargeable lithium ion. Olympus stuck with AA's across the Comedia range for several generations, which certainly makes using them much easier today. So long as the battery compartment latch continues to keep the door closed, you're good to go. And there's also a socket for external DC power on the C800L. With the photos stored in internal memory, you will of course need to connect the camera to a computer to access those files. And like most early digital cameras at this time, the three comedians employed a serial port to do so. Olympus opted for an eight pin mini DIN serial port. So you're gonna need a compatible cable and the original software running on an age appropriate computer in order to access those files, as there's no other way to get the images out of the camera, no TV output either. Now, after my year long effort to perform a similar task for my Apple QuickTape 100 retro review, do check that one out, my serial experience with the C800L was actually mercifully painless. I managed to find an archive of the Olympus Comedia software, which included support for this model, and in a joyous moment, learned that the custom mini DIN to D sub serial cable that I'd bought on eBay for the QuickTape 100 also worked on the C800L. Result. I installed the software on my homemade Windows 98 PC connected the cable and literally punched the air in delight as the camera's images were slowly copied across. So without further ado, dear viewer, I present to you a selection of photos taken with the Olympus Comedia C800L in its best quality HQ mode, of course, 27 years after it was first launched. There's no video capabilities, so it's a stills only slideshow. I'll see you in a minute.
When Olympus entered the consumer digital camera market with their Comedia brand, they had no doubts how they should look and what features were really important. I remember testing the C800L with Adele Dyer as part of our digital camera group test in the February 97 issue of Personal Computer World magazine, where it really stood out for its higher than average resolution and generous internal memory, as well as for its classic 35 mm film camera styling. When other companies were designing PC peripherals or still trying to figure out how a digital camera should look or operate, Olympus had no doubts. They simply made a camera that looked familiar and outperformed most rivals. Don't be fooled by those traditional looks. These were working cameras, not novelties. The following year, Olympus equipped the Comedia series with smart media memory card slots, eliminating the need to rely on finite internal memory and awkward serial connections. The ranges soon expanded with chunky models like the C2000Z and fixed lens digital SLR options joining the more traditional looking series. Olympus then introduced a range of DSLRs with removable lenses based around the four third sensor with the professional E1 in 2003 and the consumer E300 in 2005. Shortly afterwards, they partnered with Panasonic to launch Micro Four Thirds, the first mirrorless system designed from the ground up with a new lens mount. As for the traditional looking consumer compacts, Olympus moved away from the sliding lens covers around the mid 2000s, but that still leaves almost a decade's worth of models for collectors who, like me, appreciate their style. And best of all, their decent build quality and use of AA batteries means there is a very good chance that they'll be in working order today. Personally speaking, I'd avoid the very first models and instead go for those with memory card slots and perhaps even USB ports for direct access. Just make sure that they're sold with compatible cards. I found plenty of early comedians in good working order for less than $20 or pounds. So have a look around and bag yourself a vintage bargain. And that marks the end of another retro camera review. And as always, I'd love to hear about your first digital cameras in the comments, whether it was an Olympus Comedia or indeed any other model. And if you enjoy these reviews, please do consider giving it a like and my channel a follow so you won't miss out on any of my vintage videos. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.